Verse 11, one verse of scripture. When you're there, somebody shout, I'm there. All right, that's not enough of you. We'll wait. Now it's on the screen. Whether you're there or not, shout, I'm there. <laughs> First Peter 4 and 11, it says, if any man speak, when we talk about man there, it refers to humanity. If any, if any man or woman speak, let them speak as the oracles of God. And if anyone minister, let them do it as of the ability which God gives, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Somebody shout amen. 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 God bless you. You can be seated. I want to preach to you for just a few moments today, and I'm going to start the timer so we stick to it since we've taken a little extra time. I want to preach to you on simply the nature of a mantle. Turn to your neighbor and say the nature of a mantle. If you've been around the church very long, and, and maybe some of you haven't been, so you'll understand this as you are around the church a little longer. The word impartation. How many of you have ever heard of the word impartation in the church at some point? Many of you. Impartation, the word is a popular theme in the church world, if you will, right now. And basically what it means or what it refers to when someone talks about impartation is in its simplest form, it's describing the giving and receiving of spiritual gifts. And many times we talk about someone that flows or operates in a gift of faith. They're going to impart faith in that service. And all of a sudden, people that were struggling in faith, they, their faith is built. And, it's, and, and there's a greater measure of faith. That's that's impartation. We've all experienced it. You maybe didn't know what the word meant, but you've walked into church down or discouraged or in sin, and you've walked out with confidence and, and, and redeemed and all of these things. What happened was there was a transference. There was a spiritual connection. There was an impartation. Everybody with me? That was seven of you. I hope you'll catch up here in a minute. Impartation. Oftentimes we hear uh, Bible terms that are similar to this, like he or she has an anointing. How many of you heard something along those lines? He or she has a calling, right? He or she has a gifting. And when we discuss this, especially with respect to Old Testament terminology, at some point this particular word of mantle pops up. So it's basically in the simplest understanding one description of how the Holy Ghost settles down on someone's life or ministry. And so we say that there is the mantle of a prophet on that person. You understand what I mean? There's a mantle of prayer on that, on that sister. And so mantles are something that we ought to be familiar with beyond it just referring to in our minds of someone that's a preacher. Everybody turn to a neighbor and say, mantles belong to all of us. All right? Mantles were often simply signs or representation of someone having a specific calling from God. Prophets in the Old Testament wore mantles and they were signs of God's authority on their lives. It wasn't that the mantle carried the authority. It was that the mantle identified, you understand, that authority or that specific role of prophet. And so it is that theologians, smart Bible people, okay, they see mantles as symbols. And though we don't physically wear mantles today, when one speaks of a mantle in the church, that is church talk. Everybody say church talk. That is church talk, and it's basically the symbolism of the Holy Spirit's purpose on someone's life. Simple enough. So in all times today in this message, when I mention a mantle, I am not referring to some preacher we think is unattainable. We'll never have that, that kind of anointing. No, no. When I mention mantle, I'm simply referring to God's purpose for each of you. His spirit is upon you. You have a mantle of the anointing of the Holy Ghost upon your life. I want to bring some understanding today concerning mantles. And the first thing I want to mention and reiterate really is that everyone in this room has a call of God on their life. Yes, each of us will walk in different roles. And we will feel 
all different jobs in the church. And yes, some of us will have different measures of giftings. But I want to get it in the heart of every believer today that God has a great purpose for me and for you and for you and for you and also you too. And all y'all. Oh, Pastor, we've heard that a thousand times. Well, just wait with me a minute, all right? Some might be thinking today that I'm not sure what that purpose is yet. I'm not sure where I am supposed to work in the kingdom. Never fear. That's normal. I want you to go with me for a minute. Many of us are familiar with the ancient Bible figure of Joseph. Another description of a mantle or a calling or a purpose. Joseph had something called the dream. And listen to me, Joseph had dreams that he could not understand. Half of the Holy Ghost going to help me today. He might have had an idea that maybe that dream is referring to me being a ruler, maybe, I don't know, a, a, some kind of a, a supreme leader. But when he was sold as a slave, that dream seemed to die. That mantle seemed to be trampled upon. In fact, it was. He had a coat, a mantle of many colors that identified him as specifically favored by his father. And it seemed to be no longer an assignment upon him, uh, upon his life. But listen to me. When it comes to dreams and purpose and mantles, whatever you want to describe it, God will often keep the plan secret for a while. Why? I'm just going to I'm just going to wait out there and tell you one reason there's probably more but I want to share with someone why why can't I fully see the calling that God has for me why why does it seem shrouded at times in darkness my purpose my specific purpose and role in the kingdom it's for your own protection think about it think about it for a minute I'm not sure if you've ever even thought about this it's for your own protection not just for you but from others as well so that it won't destroy you. Watch this. In the very practical sense, or real sense for Joseph. Think about it now. You ready? If others in the palace knew about some no-name prince, future prince, if they knew that he was trapped in the dungeon, I think you know the rest of the story. If someone in authority that wanted greater authority knew that some future leader was in the dungeon, they would have done their best to assassinate assassinate Joseph. Why? He had real dreams, but he did not have full understanding. Why? Because it was for his protection. I want to tell somebody, hear me right now. God knows exactly where you are. God knows what you're searching for. God knows the difficulties that are confronting you. Don't you ever doubt, though, that in the midst of those moments of dungeon experience, that you're still called, that you're still wearing a mantle of God's anointing. He just knows what you're capable of handling. And he knows what you need right now. And so in the spiritual, that was in the practical, real sense for Joseph. In the spiritual sense, sometimes God will cover you in a mantle. And that mantle will not feel like anointing. It will feel like hidden and forgotten. But it's not hidden and forgotten. It's protection. God's keeping you from the work of the adversary as he's trying to destroy you. He knows some of you ain't ready for the big game and you're not ready for the greater anointing. And if he gave it to you right now, the enemy would take you out. And so the mantle shrouds and covers you. It's the nature of things. One of my favorite characters of scripture, David. Just Fontaine, we're going to go see David. Sight and sound and ain't they... They ain't ready for me at David, all right? Inside joke for all of you that went to Sight and Sound this weekend. One of my favorite characters of scripture, David. Have you ever thought about this? David was anointed, but in that moment he could have no clue what the reason was for. You ever really looked at it? David isn't really explained a whole lot. We kind of know because we know the end of the story and 
And we assume sometimes, Brother Deshaun, that, well, when he was anointed, he must have known. No, no. 1 Samuel 16 and 3 says, and call Jesse to the sacrifice. God's talking to the prophet Samuel. And I'll show you what to do. And you're going to anoint unto me him whom name, whose name that I've, I, I have in mind someone, he says, Samuel, and I want you to know that you're going to anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did what the Lord spake, and he came to Bethlehem. The elders of the town trembled at his coming. Can you imagine that? Walking in, in the spirit so much that the sinners just trembled. <laughs> Here he comes. And they ask him, are you coming in peace? Because we don't, we don't want any trouble. And he said, peaceably, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves. Come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons. He called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass. Somebody say it came to pass. When they were come, he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Don't look on his countenance or in the height of his stature, because I've refused that one. And then he says, by the way, you ought to know something about me. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks upon the heart. And Jesse calls Abinadab, same thing. And he calls Shama, same thing. And, and, and person after person, again, the Bible says, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And he said unto Jesse, the Lord hath not chosen these. And then Samuel said, hold up a minute. Let me ask you a pertinent question. I don't know if I even asked this, but are all, all your children here, are these all your kids, your sons? And he said, oh, well, we almost forgot, actually. There, there remaineth one. He's out tending the sheep. There remaineth one. He's the youngest, and he's just a keeper of the sheep. We, we don't see a whole lot of future in him just yet. We, we don't see a whole lot of potential yet, yet in this one. And so, and so they sent for David. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. And then Samuel took that horn of oil and he anointed David in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Man, we could preach right there, couldn't we? But, but look at that last... Last sentence. That's it. He anointed him. And then it says, and Samuel rose up and he went to Ramah. David standing there. Oil running down his face. Oil running down on his clothing. Pooling around his feet. And the man of God just up and leaves. No explanation. No just an anointing. We got David. We got Joseph hidden. David confused. And then Elisha, another one of my favorites. Here he is. We know him as the great prophet, greater even than Elijah eventually. He got a mantle. And, and he could not fathom, though, what it meant. Watch, watch this moment of calling. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, speaking of Elijah. And when you come again, uh, or come, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. And anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi. And shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And then he says, And anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat, in a place called Abimelabahalabahalamama. Tell me the Holy Ghost ain't in the Old Testament. Anoint him, watch this, to be prophet in thy room. 1 Kings 19 and 19, the Bible says, so he departed and he found Elisha. Are you ready for this? Elisha, the future greatest prophet in all of Israel outside of John the Baptist. This great man of God, he is not yet, he is to be this great worker of miracles. Where did he find Elisha? About the same place David had been found. Plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him out in a field, doing the work of a servant. And Elisha passed by him, and look at this. It says he just cast his mantle upon him. And the Bible says Elisha left, ran after Elijah. 
And I think it was perfectly reasonable for him to kind of say, hey, can I have a minute to figure some things out? And Elijah, instead of saying, here, let me talk to you about what your future is looking like. And let me talk to you about what just happened. And let me talk to you about this mantle that I touched you with. Instead, he says, go back. What have I done to you? In other words, he said, you work it out for yourself. You're going to have to go on a discovering process, Elisha. And so Elisha has a mantle, and he could not even come close to comprehending it. No explanation. No owner's manual. There is no mantle for dummies how-to book. There was no 15 things to know about an anointing. There was no 21 steps to walk into your calling. Just imagine the most powerful and feared prophet of his time touching you with his mantle. Can you imagine how overwhelming it felt for this guy that had never filled a ministry role? He had never walked with the prophet. He had never spoken a word. He had never performed a miracle. Just work in the field. I'm about to throw down here for a minute. Imagine how overwhelming it must have felt. Imagine how totally inadequate he must have felt. If only he could have heard the the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians 3 and 5 when he said, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Let me just stop right here and tell somebody, you might be feeling completely insufficient right now that you could ever do anything for God. You're in good company. Almost everyone in the Bible struggled with their mental with their anointing, with their dreams, with their their gifting, their calling. Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Peter, all of them felt unworthy of the mantle that God had given them. And with good reason. Are you ready? Why? Because the mantles were too big for them. Okay. Pastor, I'm saying their mantles didn't fit. But that is the nature of a mantle. Watch this. In the Hebrew, the mantle is called the adoret. And yes, it can mean a garment, but watch what it means here. It means large, big, powerful, excellent, mighty, glorious, The very nature of a mantle is that it is bigger and greater than the one to whom it is given. This mantle that we're talking about, the calling of God, your purpose in God. I wonder why you feel insufficient. Because the mantle, this calling God puts on your life. The purpose that God is ascribing to your life, young person. This mantle, this ministry God's designed you for. Your calling is always going to be too big for you. It will never, listen to me. It will never match who you are. Watch me here. Watch me here. There will be times you struggle with that. You will struggle with comparing the magnitude of the mantle with who you are. But mantles, purpose, calling, that is God-given, will never match who you are. Hear me? You gotta know this. God doesn't offer his mercies to you based upon who you are, but he offers them based upon who he sees you are to become. And you need to understand, your father sees the greatness in you. Your father sees the overcomer in you. Sit down for a minute. God never made chairs, but he made trees. He made the raw materials and he put them 
in the hands of mankind. And it was up to men and, and women to fulfill the gifting to the best of their ability. And it was up to mankind to fulfill the calling. Listen to me. We are called to do the best that we can with the things that God has given us. And when we do the best we can with the things God has given us, then God does what he does. And he blesses what we do. And if you ever feel overwhelmed, and if you ever feel like you're not worthy of God's blessing, or God's calling, or God's mercy, that you're not good enough, you need to remember that's because you see who you are, but God sees the greatness, and God sees the heart, and God sees what he's making you to become. to the old kid song. He's still working on me. Anybody remember that? To make me what I ought to be. Took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be, especially for some of y'all. Because he's still working on me. I think the rest of it says something like there really ought to be a sign upon my heart. Don't judge me yet. There's an unfinished part. But I'll be perfect just according to his plan fashioned by the master's loving hands. You hear this preacher, the greater the mantle just indicates how God sees you. It identifies the potential he sees in you and you have great potential in him. There's another old kid, so I am a promise. I am a possibility. I am a promise with a capital P. I am a great big bundle of potentiality. Somebody you ought to visit last Sunday's message, look the devil in the eye and say, you might have thought you won the day, but I'm still in this fight and there's potential in me and there's promise attached to me. Paul said, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. The English Standard Version says, I am a prisoner for the Lord, and I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. God did not call any of us and place a mantle upon us so that you could just sit around and wait for the greatness. The wise man in Proverbs says a man's gift will make room for itself. That word room means a broad opening. A man's gift will make a broad opening for them, for him and bring of him before great men. Here it is. Watch this. Your offering, whatever you have to offer, your offering creates opening. Pastor, I don't have much, neither did David. He was forgotten by his father. We don't know about him yet. I don't have much, neither did Elisha. He was working the field for the Holy Ghost. I don't feel like I've got much to offer. Yeah, what you need to know is it isn't the size of that offering. It isn't the value we might place on that offering. It's simple the availability and the willingness to offer that creates the opening. And so what happens is your willingness to work, your willingness to do whatever for the kingdom, and your willingness to pursue God opens the door of your calling. Some of you may not feel like you even know the purpose of your life yet or the ministry or the call or the key role. Remember what I said, everybody, and I'm not just preaching to a few future preachers. I'm preaching to everybody in this house. You have great purpose in the kingdom of God. You have a role. We are fitly framed together. God has designed you for great purpose. And if you don't yet know what that is, here's the key. You ready? The mantle 
will always go to the servant. In other words, when you don't know yet what the big plan is, the key is you serve where you are. You be available for the work of the kingdom right now. Elisha never knew that faithfulness to his father's farm would qualify him for a prophetic mantle. David could not have imagined while tending sheep in the forgotten field somewhere that he had the attention of all of heaven. And it certainly could not have dawned on him that it would be training for a kingly anointing. Hallelujah. And I just feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Hallelujah. Bishop talked about it Wednesday night. You're a child of covenant. My, my, my. Hallelujah. You're a child of covenant. God has great destiny for you. And I'm telling you right now, when I talk about the destiny of the, of the Holy Ghost, I'm not just talking about maybe you'll get rich or something. I'm talking about God's going to use you and the joy and the peace that will attach itself to your life because of God using you. Hallelujah. There is nothing like it in all of the world. There is an anointing on your life, saint of God, to influence and to impact. You matter to, king, to the kingdom. You matter to this church. You matter to this leadership team. You matter to this pastor. You're important. Covenant people. Hallelujah. 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 You know what? I'm just going to flow in this. Get away from, from the notes for a minute because it's really not from a sermonizing perspective. I don't even know if it fits, but I feel like flowing in this for just a minute. Covenant people. You know what that means? It means that God has promised by the shedding of his blood, he has promised, he has guaranteed you some things. You understand what I'm saying here? By the nature of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, by the shed blood of Jesus, it guarant you know what it is? It's a contract. It guarantees you, if you will. When we talk about pleading the blood of Jesus, and I've heard some people, I've, I've heard some people say, I'm not sure that's in the Bible. And it may not be. I'm not sure coming to church on Wednesday night is in the Bible. I think it's a good thing. I don't know that there's a whole lot of stuff that we do that are good and they're based in principle. Not in an exact chapter and verse, do such and such on Tuesday of every month or every week. But when the reason why pleading the blood is so cool, you ready for this? What, what it is in essence, plead is a, we, we think of, oh God, please. No, 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 you need to understand this. A pleading is a court document. What does that mean? A pleading is what is offered to the court to make your case. Oh, so when I plead the blood of Jesus, when my family is facing adversity and I don't know an answer and all of a sudden I find myself in a prayer closet and I say, I plead the blood of Jesus. You know what you're doing? You are bringing a guarantee before all of heaven and all of hell and a reminder for yourself. I've got certain rights. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus. I, I plead the blood. Plead the blood. Hallelujah. The nature of the bloodshed guarantees your protection. It guarantees your victory. It guarantees his mercy on your life. We are covenant people. Last, last Sunday, I was, we were in fight mode, right? I'm going to knock your block off, devil. I'm in the fight. I mentioned it last week. You mess with my wife. The directive is for me to turn the other cheek 
when you're messing with me, I don't know, maybe I got that right. But I, I, don't, I don't think it's there that I got to do it when you're messing with my wife. Why? Because it's a covenant relationship. It is a promise covenant, a covenant built upon vows. And so when somebody, whether it's the devil or a person, messes with my wife, she has rights by the nature of the covenant that I'm a protector. You mess with that little girl back there running the media? I'm telling you right now, I'm probably going to go to jail when some boy comes knocking. I'm just telling you. Brother Adam, I'm telling you right now, if he does the wrong thing, you better pray for your pastor. Why? Because it is a covenant relationship. My blood is in her. The nature of my bloodline says I am her protector. And she has certain things she can expect. Why? Because my blood my blood says so. Hallelujah. I hope some of you have gotten this connection. But the reason why it's so important that you realize you're covenant people is because by the nature of his blood, you have access to some certain rights that you can claim. I am God's child and therefore, devil, the blood of Jesus is against you. That's why we can say when the enemy comes in like a flood, you can bake your, you can take it to the bank. You can bank your life on it. God's going to raise up a standard because we're covenant people. Oh. And that's why. I've only preached 31 minutes. That's a lot of message for 31 minutes. Give me 10 more. That's why. Okay, pastor, how are you going to connect this? That's why his promises and his anointing and his gifting and his mental, whatever you want to call it, and that's why it offers greater things than where you are right now. Why? Because it's not of my qualifications and it's not my talents or my skills. It is because I'm covenant people. Oh. I'm just going to flow in it. Mantle's bigger, too big. Because it's not based upon who and what you are, it is based upon who you are to become. Pastor, I don't feel that anointing yet. I don't walk in that yet. Yeah, but he gave it to you because he knows what your future should be in him. Jesus. Why? It's a covenant. It's a covenant. Sister Karen, I look across this congregation and I see so many of you. Sister Karen, when you walked in to my house at a ladies group for the first time and you walked in depressed and you walked in hopeless and you walked in not knowing what the future held, you walked in tormented, you know what, that's what you saw. But God said, that's my covenant girl. And God said, I, it won't always be that way. Why? Because I got a mantle in mind for her. I got a prayer purpose in mind for her. There's a greatness in her. And the devil might have thought you were defeated, but God saw what the mantle would bring upon your life. Brother Adam, I have preached in front of thousands of people. I pre I'm telling you right now, I didn't feel any more anointing on me at general conference than I do in this moment right here. Feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost so strong on me. I'll tell you right now, Brother Lucas is running the camera. There was a time when he and I weren't seeing eye to eye. And I was like, God, what do I do with this dude? Then the Holy Ghost spoke to me. And he said, you mentor him 
not for where he is now, but for where you see his potential being. And I'm going to tell you right now, I couldn't imagine not having his, his partnership with me in leading this church. Why? Because God doesn't see where you are. God sees what you are to become. And that is the nature of his mantle. Sean, let me tell you something. The devil's tried real hard over the last few weeks. You know why? Because not only does God see your future and what you're going to become, but the devil knows just enough that if I don't try and take him out now, if I don't try and defeat him now, there's such a great calling, there's such a great mantle, that devil and his kingdom are going to suffer. Uh, everybody stand with me. Jesus, I want you to lift your hands right now and just pray in the Holy Ghost for a minute. Come on, he's in charge of this right here. He's taking us right here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's the nature of a mantle. God sees what I'm becoming. And I'm a covenant person. The blood says, I am an overcomer. The blood says, he is my healer. The blood says, I am redeemed. The blood says, my sin is covered. The blood. Uh, hallelujah. Come on, I know you're struggling with I'm not good enough to be a prayer warrior. That makes a real impact. I'm not good enough to lead others. I don't know enough about what the Bible says to share the gospel. Come on, the mantle's bigger than you. Walk in at where you are now and see the greatness that God has in store. Hey. Come on, that mantle, it's always going to have room for you to become what he's designed you to be. Come on, that mantle, it's like an overgarment. It covers imperfections. It covers multitudes of sin. That's the value and the nature of a mantle. Why is it so big? It's covering me. And it's, it's permitting me to become.